Welcome back here on the Good Morning Artesia Radio Show. Michael Redman from the Artesia Historical Museum and Art Center joins us for our weekly update. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing fairly well. How are you? Well, we are getting ready for an exciting couple of days and then hopefully a couple of days off. <laughs> so that'll be that'll be uh, nice. So Yeah, it's, it's hard to believe it's September already. Which it is. Uh, It'll be time to start planning on trips to see the leaves as they change colors in the forests. You know, I always forget about that until after it's too late. And uh, so I'm glad you reminded me of that. Around uh, thinking about here in New Mexico, what what where's a good place to go and what time do you plan for uh, to do that? Well, I, I'm still trying to learn that myself. I know all the good places... Uh, up uh, near Taos, but that's a little bit too far of a drive. Hmm. Well, we'll have to do but, a little investigating and see at Rio Doso and Cloudcroft what uh, what are some good places. I think I also remember people talking about McKittrick Canyon, uh, you know, south of Carlsbad towards uh, El Paso. A lot of people go up there to look at leaves. So we'll, uh, we'll have to figure that out. Yep, and uh, no matter what you do, you'll have to be sure to fill up your gas tank before you leave. That's right, and that leads us to to our topic for today. And uh, you wanted to talk about gasoline, obviously something we take extremely for granted nowadays. You need gas for your car or truck. You pull into a service station, you fill up. We've got a big old refinery over there that uh, is uh, refining oil products, uh, different fuels and things like that. But... Looking back at the history of Artesia, what can you tell us about the history of gasoline? Well, the history of gasoline before 1905, when this was uh, still unincorporated, uh, gasoline that people needed uh, did not come from, uh, from Artesia or from any of the New Mexico oil wells. It actually came uh, by train from Ohio and Pennsylvania. Wow. And it wasn't until 19, uh, starting around 1905 when the town was uh, was uh, getting uh, incorporation and cityhood uh, uh, established. That's when that's when you started to see a lot a lot more oil coming from uh, te uh, Texas and California because of the uh, Texas and Cal uh, California oil booms. But for people just living in town, they got their gas from pretty much any store that they could find it at. It's not like today where it's all in underground tanks at specific service stations. People would go to, uh, you know, dry goods stores. They'd go to uh, just general merchandise stores, lumber yards, and uh, feed and fuel type stores like uh, Bullock's. Uh, originally, uh, those feed and seed type stores sold uh, coal and uh, kerosene and gasoline. Um, in addition to selling, uh, you know, animal feed. Hmm. So what is the, what was the f main storage container then? Did they come in barrels, gallon jugs? Uh, how, how was this gasoline then uh, parceled out and, and sold and distributed? Well, it would be brought in uh, on a uh, tank car, on a train, put into a, a, a tank at the uh, stores, or at the main uh, wholesaler in the area. And then it'd be parceled out uh, based upon whatever people, you know, needed. So if someone was, if someone uh, pulled up and needed to buy some, some gas for a planned trip later on, they would buy a gas tank or a gas can. Mm -hmm. you know, a five gallon, 10 gallon uh, can that they would, uh, you know, carry with them. Uh, if someone had a greater need, they would bring their own uh, their own tank over and or their own barrels. Uh, this was still an era when uh, people would strap uh, metal cans to uh, horse-drawn wagons, in addition to uh, you know actual tank trucks. So they'd fill it up directly from the tank at those uh, various uh, stores. Hmm. And what did and I haven't. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, what did people use the gasoline for in 1905? I mean, were there were there vehicles that people drove, or were there other uses, other types of uh, uses for the gasoline? Oh, there were vehicles. Uh, there were uh, there were 
were livery companies that uh, had uh, buses and cars that they'd use to drive people around, sort of like taxis, except they weren't, you know, taxis. They were, they had a variety of uh, vehicles that they would, uh, that they would, uh, you know, send out for people to use. Mm-hmm. Um, but people had their own vehicles as well. And I read an interesting account of uh, someone who drove uh, from Artesia over to Hope and then to uh, Duncan. And uh, when they got to Duncan, they uh, bought kerosene instead of gasoline. And the car's engine was so, uh, you know, crude that it, it was able to burn the kerosene. <laughs> Interesting. So they figured out a way to fuel that vehicle to get back, I guess. And by uh, 1915, uh, Artesia started to get actual uh, companies that specialize in gasoline. Uh, There was a Texas company. Nowadays, it's Texaco. But they had a a, a small shop uh, on somewhere in Artesia. I have not found an actual address. Because mm-hmm. they didn't put addresses in uh, some of the early uh, city directories, but there was a company that specialized in selling cans of gas from Texas, and we have uh, one such can in our collection. Oh wow! Okay. But it wasn't until 1923 that Artesia actually had a service station. The Pyre Pyre's service station owned by Ben Pyre and his brother, Roy Pyre. Okay. Uh, It was a gas station located um, on Main Street at uh, 421 and 423 West Main, so across the street from the old city hall. Okay. And it was a full-service gas station, the the very first one that Artesia ever had. It had a... you You can pull up and get uh, your tires replaced or repaired, uh, you know, get fuel for your car, get a car washed, uh, get just basic maintenance checked on the uh, on the engine, get more water and more oil for the engine. And they had a little service shop uh, in the back for doing, a, for doing repairs as well. Hmm. But it was, uh, they eventually expanded and focused more on uh, tires and they even renamed themselves uh, 1927 as Pyre Rubber Company. Okay. And we have photos of uh, of that as well. It's a uh, it's a you know, tiny little uh, tiny little stucco shop building um, with a uh, with an awning. Uh, it has a gas pump in the front under the awning, and there's photos of Ben and Roy. Uh, in the early in the early twenties, uh, uh, Ben is behind the counter, wearing uh, a suit and a bow tie and a, and a fedora. Mm. And Ben uh, is uh, obviously he's the one who did the physical work. He's also wearing a suit and a and a uh, soft uh, driver's hat, but he's wearing a uh, uh, he's wearing white coveralls over the suit. Which uh, indicates that he was the service guy in that. Yes, and okay. it's it's, it's kind of interesting how fashion as well has changed significantly since the 1920s because he's wearing a suit because he was ex- uh, expected to wear a suit. Well, and, and he was getting ready to have his picture taken, and that just didn't happen, you know, you know not like we pull out our phones and take selfies and photos all the time. I mean, that, that almost an event. <laughs> oh, not, not really, because his, uh, his coveralls are quite uh, dirty. Yeah. So, and what did they call their, their the, the tire when they converted pretty much to tires? What did they call the name of the store? They called it uh, Pyre Rubber Company. See, I don't know why they didn't call it Pyre Tire. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you and I weren't around to help them out with their uh, <laughs> what they would call themselves. Uh, either that or it was already taken. Well, that's interesting. So we didn't have a service station until 1923, even though people would have had vehicles and been and there would have been a few travelers, I guess, a few travelers coming through town at that time. Well, if people needed a uh, service or assistance, they would go to uh, 
mechanics. Uh, there are mechanics in town. There was a uh, in 1915. Um, there was a uh, one uh, automobile dealership in town that okay. I could find. Okay. It was Max Motor Car Company, uh, owned by G. A. Holmack. Okay. And they did uh, repairs and maintenance and uh, sales. Okay. Uh, Max Automotive Company, you said? Motor Car Company. Motor Car Company, I'm sorry. And uh, does it say where they were located? Uh, no, because it's, again, the uh, the city directory. It was, those city directories were written for people who already mostly knew how to get around towns or... It was also in the day where you could just write a person's name and the town on a envelope, and you know, the post office will deliver it to that person. Sure, sure. Not not a big area to cover, and not a lot of people. So, uh, by by today's standards, so. But there were eventually other uh, service stations in town in the '30s. Okay. Uh, one of them was the Cave Grocery, owned by the Cave Brothers. It was at Seconds in Chisholm, and they sold gas, uh, they sold groceries, um, they did, uh, uh, they, they also did uh, wholesale um, gas uh, uh, sales and moving, because they had a, a business agreement with the Pecos Diamonds Refinery, mm -hmm. south of town. Okay. And that gas pump in front of the museum, that was from the cave grocery. Okay. So by by the 30s, instead of just walking in or going out back and getting a container full of fuel, they actually started to have under underground tanks and ways to uh, to to get gas out of a out of a pump into your vehicle. Yes, uh, although Pyre's uh, gas station in the 20s also had a uh, gas pump. They had a gas ground pump. tanks. Right, and they weren't electrically powered. They were uh, gravity, weren't they? I mean, it, uh, I forget exactly how they worked, but you moved the lever a certain way and it would come up to the glass and then it would use gravity to go into the vehicle? Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, The reason for it going into the, into the glass was because that was how they would measure out how much gas people were getting. Okay. It had markers and you would pump it up into that and once it hits the marker, you'd stop pumping, and then you just uh, drain it into the uh, vehicle or into the uh, gas can or the gas tank. Right, whatever it was that they were putting the fuel into. So, interesting. So that uh, fuel pump in front of the museum actually came from the uh, Cave grocery store, which uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I, I figured it came from back in the day, but I didn't know where. <laughs> so that's that's good. That is excellent. Well, what else do you want to share about uh, gasoline and Artesia's history? Well, it's just had an interesting history. It took a few years before people were able to buy uh, Artesia gasoline. Mm hmm Because, like I said, it originally came from Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, originally, uh, when they first discovered ga uh, oil, it was found in Pennsylvania. Right, right. And they found... Uh, they were mostly interested in getting kerosene, um, but it, it took them a while to figure out that you could distill oil into a lot of different uh, fluids. Right, right. Yeah, no, it was uh, the the use was like you say was for the for the kerosene that uh, that was what they needed for the lamps and other other things like that. But uh, as we learned what we could do with it, things uh, things changed, of course. And they still have the oil and gas industry in uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. I don't know if it's as extensive as it is in the western states, but uh, but it's still it's still going on. Yeah, my understanding is that they mostly do uh, uh, hydraulic, uh, you know, fracturing uh, in Ohio. It's not like the the wells that are still gushing out uh, oil. Right, right. But it's, it's still going on. It is. It sure is. But most of the, uh, most of the gas by 1915 came from Texas. Okay. And, uh, and probably get a bunch of it from there even to this day, I'm guessing. So, 
Well, it's a, it's a worldwide commodity now, that's for sure, because the, uh, the oil that we pump out of the ground here goes to all kinds of different places around the world, and oil from around the world comes here because it just depends on, on what it's best refined into, what it works best in. And it's a, it's a worldwide commodity, that's for sure. Yeah, it's just fascinating to think about uh, the things you use nowadays. Where did it originally come from? That's right. Now, the museum is still closed at the present time? Uh, yes, we're, we're, we're getting ready to reopen, but still at the moment we're closed. Okay, but uh, you hope and to reopen soon? And when we do soon? reopen... Oh, sorry. I said you hope to reopen soon? Yes. Okay. And you said and, when, uh, and when you do reopen, you started to say before I interrupted you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to give the museum hours uh, okay. when we are open again. Okay. Uh, 10 to 1 and 2 to 4, Tuesday through Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time. I always learn something about the history of Artesia and enjoy having you on to talk about it. So we'll, uh, we'll have you on again next week. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Michael Redman from the Artesia Historical Museum and Arts Center. That's going to wrap up.